Now, welcome back to the show. I'm delighted to be joined by Paralympic gold medalist and Allianz Insurance Ambassador Ellen Keane, head of the Manchester 2023 Allianz Para Swimming World Championships. They get underway on Monday week as the longest supporters of para sport in Ireland. Allianz has supported Ellen since 2016 and are the only brand in Ireland to be supporting the Olympic and Paralympic movement for such a long period of time at both a global and local level. Ellen, uh, welcome back to the show. I don't really need to say that because practically this was your show for a while as well. Uh, <laughs> such has been your kind of multi-arcing uh, media landscape over the last while um, and that's kind of led to your neck you're like you're basically closing in on your next phase of life as it were uh, at the tender age of 28 you're contemplating yeah. retirement yeah I am yeah so this will be my last world championships and then uh, the Paris Paralympic Games will be my fifth and final games and then I'm hoping to be back in that seat <laughs> <laughs> well, that's steady on uh, when did the, the, the theory or the thought of retirement kind of first enter your head um, I guess people uh I don't know, presumed like teammates of mine have come and go over the years and Tokyo itself was my fourth games and I, I won the gold medal and I reached the top and I think people presumed I'd retire after Tokyo. But um, the fact that it was an empty stadium, the fact that I was only 25, I still knew my body was capable of keeping keep going. And I guess with the pandemic and and people not being able to do sport and knowing how much sport means to people, I I really realized the privileged position that I was in and I realized how much sport meant to people. So I decided to stay on. I decided that I wanted to retire in a, a, a stadium with a full crowd and hopefully lots of Irish people in that crowd so that I can say goodbye to to the sport I love in front of the people I love. I don't like I don't think you're alone in those games in Tokyo being the ones that gave a lot lot of the competing athletes and the ones lucky enough to go an extra four years because that thing of competing with nobody particularly when you think of swimming and para swimming like the atmosphere that does be in those pools is incredible the way they're roofed the the atmospherics the acoustics and all that makes for such an experience that to be deprived of that takes away a huge element of the sport you know what? I remember walking into the Tokyo Aquatic Center on day one and thinking, thank God this stadium is going to be empty because it was really? so intimidating. It was, I don't know what it was, but the the, the lay of the, the land, the pool itself, the stadium was so intimidating. So I nearly looked up at the stands and I was like, thank God there's going to be no one in that. I don't know how I'd manage with that, um, with that pressure, but... It, this the with no one being in the sands it was kind of a little bit special because mm. irish people themselves are so loud they're the best supporters in the world they make themselves known and it's no different to my teammates so the fact that i was able to hear my teammates my staff i was able to find them in the crowd so easily it it made the whole experience a little bit special and it, it's a games like no other and i'll never experience that again but i do want to see how i can do in front of a, a full stadium and the fact that these ones in paris are going to be so comparatively close to home as well and i guess you can throw manchester into the mix as well for the worlds in a week or two's time like that makes a huge amount of difference when people can travel and maybe even local support who might be living over there can can add their voices too yeah definitely I know a few of my friends are heading over my parents are heading over my sister's heading over um, but uh, my teammate Nicole Turner a lot of her family are from Manchester so the stadium I think the tickets are sold out because of Nicole's family <laughs> like it's going to be green and she'd probably have accommodation for everybody as well once uh, these particular <laughs> events uh, are out of the way. Um, leading up to Manchester, like I, I mentioned there, uh, giving a lady's ages away, which is very rude of me. But the weird thing is, I was going through the results of the, the City Power Games recently and they would have the year of birth beside each swimmer. And I think going down through them without wanting to put you on the spot again, it, it struck me that you were still one of the oldest uh, even though you're like in your mid to late 20s at this stage, it seems yeah. that people kind of have longer careers but start, you know, much, much younger. Uh, you look at Dervla, who's in the team, which is, well, she's going, like, competition days go back to her preteens, and she's still only 15 now. So it seems like you start early and you seem to end early too. 
Yeah, I think I have a kickboard from 2007 when, which I think was the year Dervla was born, and I still bring it everywhere with me. So, um, yeah, I don't know what it is about swimming. I guess it's it's one of those sports that works really well with the school cycle. So it's easy to fit in swimming before school and swimming after school. And then I guess the older you get, when it comes to college or work, it's harder to kind of fit it in. And it's also not a very social sport because of the hours that you train. It's it's really really early in the morning it's later in the evening so I guess I I struggled a bit this year because um I don't know I I'm 28 the next in line to me is is Barry who's 21 so there is a big age gap between me and my teammates and it can be quite lonely and it can be quite isolating like they are great people they are great teammates but we're having different conversations. I'm getting excited about a gardener coming to my house and <laughs> they're getting excited about college. And I'm like, I'm, I've been out of college for a while. Um, so yeah, it, ha- it, it is hard being an older athlete, but I guess you kind of just have to take it uh, with a pinch of salt and realize the experience that you have and the experience that you can give to the, your teammates around you. And even Dervla came on the camp with us. We we're just home from a camp in Fort Ventura and the beginning of the camp, she didn't really talk that much. And then towards the end of the camp, she was coming out of her shell and talking loads. And it was just really great to see and even being able to to give her a few tips about how to manage a busy lane because she wouldn't have been used to a busy lane back home. So just like little things like that in terms of when we get to competition, how she's going to manage that is it's good to be able to give back because I was that young kid once I did have the older athletes telling me what to do and and helping me out and one of those older athletes was the man who's my coach now so Dave Malone his last Paralympic Games was my my first Paralympic Games and that's that's kind of what has kept me going because I saw what he did for me. So it's nice to be able to give back to the younger generation then. Did you have a conscious thing at the time of you were going to soak up as much information and advice as possible when you were that younger swimmer or have you just uh, found yourself when you're imparting that, you know, those bits of advice to the likes of Dervil and to the likes of Nicole that you've gone, oh, wow, I actually took in more than I thought I did at the time. Um, no, I think at the time I just thought because Dave had won gold medals himself at the Paralympics. So I I just thought like, I want to listen to this person. He's really cool. Um, and then the rest of the teammates were just my friends. So I guess I was just a little bit naive to the whole thing and, and hoping to do a good job. And do you know when you're like, obviously like we're not like this anymore but when you're younger you just don't want to get in people's way as well so it was just kind of doing everything to keep everyone happy as well um so just kind of giving back advice i i definitely feel like i'm really old when i do that because to me it's a second nature now and it's strange to me that some people don't know certain things but um yeah it, it is nice and it's nice to feel like you've something else to give to a team as well have you considered coaching yourself beyond your actual competing days Oh God, no, <laughs> not at the moment. I think it's just purely because my whole life has been swimming, my whole life sport. And I know how much commitment and time it takes that coaches volunteer even. And I think I need to just step away from swimming and, and try new things at the moment. It's, it's something that maybe I'll do in a few years time, but while I have I always say when I retire, I'll have six months left of my 20s to myself. So I'm going to enjoy those six months. (laughs) When you took that break to do um, Dancing with the Stars, did that kind of take you out of the matrix, as it were, and get you to have a look around at what other things, I guess, life has to offer? Um, Yeah, definitely. I think, like, yes or no, because when I did Dancing with the Stars, it was still we were still following COVID protocol. So we were still really strict in terms of we weren't allowed to socialize with each other. We had to wear masks all the time. And then the environment I was in was competitive as well. So we were still training uh, five hours a day and then I would swim after that. So I was still very much committed to using my body to work hard. Um, And and when the show ended, I actually had really itchy feet because I really wanted to get back in the pool and I really wanted to compete again. So it, it's it's a good thing I did the show because it made me really miss swimming. Um, but all the opportunities that I got from it were incredible. And I am excited to see when I do retire, what path I do go down. But I definitely enjoyed the media side of it. It was really fun. Um, I think I did okay. <laughs> I, I won't do dancing again. I think that <laughs> my will never recover from that experience, but 
it, it was good to try something new for that year because it definitely helped me stay in the sport that I'm in. Yeah, um, you did the podcasting thing as well. Uh, you've done bits and pieces for us, but you presented the D word as well, which I guess um, helps put over another side of uh, disabilities and gets people to uh, open up about them, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And I honestly wouldn't have been able to do that without Allianz because they were my sponsor for that podcast. Um, and it was really important for me. I, I guess I've always been at the front of the camera. I've always been the person being interviewed. And I always feel as someone with a disability who's in the limelight, I have a responsibility to give that opportunity to other people as well because I only know what life is like having one arm I don't know what it's like being in a wheelchair or I I don't know what it's like acquiring a disability and my podcast each episode interviews a different person so from a different perspective of someone with a disability because I I guess people just assume that disability is one word and and it's one certain way, but there are things in life I'm able to do that other people aren't able to do. And there's things in life that uh, I would really get insecure about or struggle with that other people mightn't. So for me, the podcast was just kind of a way of of opening up that conversation and hope hopefully get people thinking um, and reconsidering when they make certain decisions and, and maybe hopefully be able to help change other people's lives. So I had so much fun with that, but it is, there's only like six episodes and even just managing the schedule of getting guests in because they were my guests. I have to work around their schedule yeah. as well. and I was swimming full time as well. So it's a hard thing. That's why there's no season two yet. <laughs> give it time. It might tire. <laughs> yeah, no, give it time. Uh, podcast series are difficult things to try and corral. Take it as somebody who's done a couple of them down through the years as well. But like you've mentioned before in the past that it took you a while, I guess, to come out of your shell and to be more confident about the person that you are. Like, how does it feel to be the person who's trying to draw that sense of uh, being comfortable about themselves out of other people? Um, I guess I'm I'm really proud of it, but I I I think I took it for granted a little bit because I'm so confident because of sport and I'm so confident because I learned to love my body through swimming. Um and when I did Dancing with the Stars, I started that show being overly confident and thinking I was going to be okay and that I could do everything. And I guess I was confronted with being a beginner again and what it's like being a beginner with a disability again and not having someone to compare myself to. And that really frightened me a little bit. And it made me feel a little bit like I was a teenager again when I was the the different one and um, I was the disabled one on the show. And it was really important for me for the the narrative not to just be about being a disabled dancer. Um, And with the podcast, I guess as someone with a disability interviewing another person with a disability, we can kind of have a bit of a laugh because there's kind of things you can talk about that if someone who doesn't understand or doesn't have that life experience, they don't have that privilege of bringing that sort of conversation up. Um, So I, I guess it gives people a little bit of a safety net that this is a safe space to discuss it like I understand. And I guess the more vulnerable you are with your guests are the more willing and the more vulnerable you're willing to be. Um, it shows more people how human all people with disabilities are because mm. we all have the same emotions. We may look different. We may have different abilities and disabilities, but at the end of the day, our emotions are all the same. And I guess when two people with disabilities are talking to each other, you can see that human element and you can see the emotions and that's what people can relate to. So you've got competing, you've got the podcast, you've got uh, Dancing with the Stars in your rearview mirror. You've got a book coming out as well. Um, do you ever give yourself a few minutes off? Um, I'll do that when I retire. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tell us about the book. I, I can't um, take time off because I, I just, I'll get so bored. And with the book itself, I'll be able to talk about it more when it's released in January. It's pre-sale at the moment. But the experience of writing that book, I kind of just... I've never really taken a seat back and looked at all that I've achieved. And I I don't like talking too much about the things I've done because 
I don't know. I, I just see it as my life and they're just kind of things I've done along the way. But it, I've had so many life experiences and I feel like I've been so many different people along the way and I've grown so much. I think reflection for me has been the biggest thing in my personal life, but also in my career that's helped me get stronger and helps me be a better person. And with the book itself, I, I hope that the lessons that are in it will be able to to guide someone else to becoming a better, happier version of themselves too. It's not flat out autobiography, I gather. No, I didn't want to do an autobiography because I'm still competing and yeah. I'm 28 and I didn't feel, I felt like if I brought out an autobiography, I wouldn't be able to take myself seriously. So <laughs> it's just more about all the little things I've learned along the way um, to, to becoming the person I am. And the title of the book, Perfectly Imperfect, just is me. Like I'm, I'm chaotic and I'm a mess at times. And I think people see me nearly as, like people come up to me often and ask like how did you get so confident as someone with a disability or how are you able to do these things and it's not like it happened overnight it, it's been a journey and as I said with Dancing with the Stars there were moments when I felt completely lost I felt completely alone and and it's important that people realize that that it's not it's a journey you go on and you're going to have your highs and your lows and it's the same in sport like I'm I was at the top once that was the one time two years ago and I hope to get back there but there has to be the ups and downs and there has to be the learnings along the way and that's what makes you stronger competition wise where do you feel you are now as I mentioned you had those events in, in Sheffield and Minneapolis and you've been at training camp as you mentioned in Fort Aventura too where do you feel you are heading into to Manchester I'm in a good place right now. Um, earlier on in the season, I wasn't. Uh, from January to April, I, I guess I I was starting to struggle. I was really feeling the impact of, of being the older athlete and feeling a little bit, not that I felt like I didn't belong, but I just didn't know my place. And uh, I, I kind of had lost the love for the sport a little bit. Um, I didn't know how to race and I didn't understand how I didn't know how to race and it was starting to really affect me and um, my staff were so supportive of helping me find my way back. Um, so I did a lot of work with my sports psych and as I was starting to make my way back to myself, I picked up a little bit of a niggle in my shoulder, which lasted about six weeks and that had me worried as well. But the camp that we just came back from, I had absolutely no issues with my shoulder. I had a really good camp and and coming home, I just feel like myself again. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm really excited. Manchester is a pool I've competed in many times. I was in boarding school in England. So we had a few competitions in there when, there when I was younger. So I know the pool well. I feel like I have a little bit of an advantage there. And my main event is on the final day. So I get to rest. I get to watch everyone else compete and see them do a good job. And then it's my turn. How many events are you going to be entered in in Manchester? I'm just doing the 100 brush stroke. Okay. And can I ask a really stupid question? Because I was seeing your quotes in the lead up to the, the World Championships and you were saying that the pool in Manchester is really fast. Now, for the <laughs> layperson, like a pool is a pool and water is water. And I'm not yeah. sure how it could be any faster. You, you know better than me. So tell me how a pool can be faster than the other. Do you know what? I I actually don't know this the the actual facts, but um, for me, whenever the water is cold, like the colder the pool, the faster the pool to me because you dive in, you get that extra adrenaline shot, and then um, the depth of the pool, depending, they say that the deeper the pool, the faster you go. So when it comes to like a game, the pool tends to be very deep because they have to fit in the cameras and things like that underneath. Um, so the pools tend to be a lot faster. But I always swim fast in kind of a shallower pool. Um, so I don't know. For me, my history of the pool, I've always swam really well there. I've always swam fast time. So I'm just trying to focus in on that energy <laughs> and use that confidence from past experiences uh, going forward. I'm, I'm curious as well, when you mentioned that you'd forgotten how to race, like tell me a little bit about that. Like what, what's, what's involved in kind of losing that little bit of edge or losing that little bit of sense of how to race? I don't know. I, I guess it's just when I, I was I was going through the the motions I've always gone through in terms of my race routine, my warm ups were the same, my my um routine I'd have on the day was the same but when it came to standing up and racing I just didn't have the fight in me and I I don't know why I I guess I I actually I don't know why um and then the more I raced 
the slower I was getting. So I think I was just getting really frustrated with myself and I, I just needed to give myself a break. I, we had a week off then in, um, in April and I slowly started to come back to myself. So I think it was just the emotional energy of it all, uh, was starting to really get to me. And as I said, like the loneliness I was feeling was, was really getting me down. And, um, they always say like a happy athlete is a fast athlete. Um, so I just wasn't, I just wasn't 100% happy. Um, but thankfully I've found my way back and I found that happiness again. And for me, the, the best outcome that can happen in Manchester isn't really necessarily a gold medal. It's just more racing and, and being happy with my race, um, which I haven't had this year. So I'm, I, I'm eager to get in. And Olympic qualification from Manchester will be a bonus I'd imagine. Yeah, Paralympic qualification. If Paralympic I qualify, qualification, pardon me, of course, yeah. I'm make, making records. <laughs> <laughs> but Paralympic, uh, uh, you know, getting to basically qualify a year out, that takes the pressure off. That means you, you can kind of hone your craft between now and Paris and, and go from there. Yeah, definitely. It means you can focus purely on the games itself. Um, you will be kind of going to different competitions and, and trying to get up on those world rankings. So the goal for me is to finish in the top two and hopefully that will be enough to get me that that qualification for Paris. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed and touch wood and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure we'll be plaguing you for interviews and possibly you'll be plaguing, you know, us get me out of this leash <laughs> between now uh, and the Paralympics in 2024 as well. Uh, but thank you so much, Ellen Keane, for speaking to us ahead of those Manchester 2023 Alliance Paris World Championship.